All right, welcome everyone to uh, our next uh, installation of Michigan Nature at Home uh, virtual speaker series. Uh, my name is Lauren Ross. I am the communications and events coordinator for the Michigan Nature Association. Uh, I am very pleased that you all could join us tonight um, for our last uh, Michigan Nature at Home for the year. Um, we will be having more next year, so stay tuned for those. But in the meantime, we'll get started um, with tonight's presentation. Um, Michigan Nature Association is um, Michigan's oldest uh, statewide land conservancy. Um, since 1952, uh, we have been working to uh, protect and conserve um, Michigan's natural features all across the state. We were from um, the Indiana Ohio border to the tip of the Keweenaw Peninsula through our network of more than 180 nature sanctuaries. So um, we're very proud of the work that we do and uh, very proud to work with uh, partners like our speakers tonight on uh, helping to share uh, conservation value of Michigan. Um, my slide. There we go. Um, so tonight uh, we are recording, so the recording will be available uh, for viewing later. Um, if you do have questions, um, the, please use the Q&A function of Zoom. Um, we will be getting to most, hopefully all of the questions uh, at the end of the meeting. Um, so just keep using the Q&A box throughout uh, to enter any kind of questions you might have and we will uh, get to those. Uh, the Q&A box, if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, usually pops up if you drag your mouse um, down to the bottom of your screen, if you're on a laptop or uh, pull down the uh, menu options on the top of the screen from an iPhone or an iPad. Uh, we also have closed captioning enabled tonight um, so if you see those, good, um, and if not, you should be able to turn them on in the same uh, menu option. Uh, tonight, uh, we are joined by uh, Jason Whalen and Chris Zucker of Fauna Creative, uh, and I will pass it over to them and they will introduce themselves. Hi, everybody. I just want to start by thanking Michigan Nature Association for inviting us to share a story and I want to thank all of you for coming out to spend this evening with us. So I'm Jason Whalen and I'm joined by Chris Zucker. We're a, a pretty small production team. Uh, it's just the two of us. So we both wear a lot of hats. Chris is the director of photography or cinematographer and, and lead editor and I'm the producer, director, and, and second camera. So together, the two of us make up Fauna Creative. And we wanted to share a little bit about what we do um, and talk about conservation storytelling with you tonight. So we wanted to start with a quote um, that is, find where your greatest talents and the world's greatest needs meet. This is something that we heard relatively recently that resonated a bit with our story. So ours is a story of following our passions, shaping that into a career and becoming part of solving some of the most important issues that we see facing our planet. So we are Fauna Creative and we're conservation storytellers. So we are a small production team out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. We like to think that we sort of have a dream job. We get to work to advocate for land protection. We get to learn about all sorts of aspects of our natural world what issues exist, how people are working to solve them. And we get to be on the front lines of conservation. We get to tell stories about people who respect nature or research or recreate in our natural areas. And that's taken us to some incredible places. It's given us the opportunity to interview lots of fascinating people. It's deepened our understanding of and our connection to the world around us. And it's put into perspective what's at stake with our natural resources. And so we're on just a journey that's leading us down a road where we get to use our art to amplify voices and conservation. We think that storytelling has a role to play in conservation. Education and inspiration are important. We think that you need a connection to something in order to truly get involved in protecting it. So our job is to tell stories, to elevate issues and bring our viewers into a world where they can establish a connection with whatever aspect of the natural world we're, we're highlighting. Because at the end of the day, if we're going to protect nature and biodiversity, it's gonna take bringing more people together who care enough to act, who care enough to donate or volunteer or um, work to solve these incredibly important issues. You know, will species survive 
Will our water be clean and abundant? Will we be able to reverse habitat loss and restore a planet that sustains life? With everything going on today, it seems like the rest of the world doesn't think about or care about these questions all that often. And that's a problem that we're trying to solve with our work. So while Chris and I are both from Michigan, we met each other while working uh, um, and living in Chicago. He called Bigfoot Media. We did a lot of documentary and commercial video work there. We did every sort of client project imagine. We did videos for the local ballet and uh, the local opera and craft brewers guild. We did work with arts nonprofits. We did commercials for a mosquito hunting company or a mattress store, or the parks department. We're doing music videos. We did work with the radio stations in town, social ventures, tech startups, and even a pet food company. And so Chris and I did a lot of this work uh, in Chicago, and then we'd leave the city a handful of times each year to work on some conservation and nature projects. And when we'd rush back to help our team take on the next project. So it's this time in Chicago that really accelerated our level of expertise and experience in the industry. It helped develop some of our creative styles and, and everything. But after a few years, it became clear that the conservation work that we were leaving to do scratched an itch that some of the other projects just weren't. And, and Chicago didn't quite feel like home. Being from Michigan, Michigan was always home. And so therefore, Fauna Creative was born. So we moved our families to Michigan and made a commitment to devote more of our creative energy toward conservation storytelling. We thought there was an opportunity to play a role in addressing things we cared about, like the biodiversity crisis. We knew that there is an opportunity to use our talents and our skill set to fill a void in the conservation movement. And we thought this was an opportunity to advance some issues that we cared about. And it's really easy to talk about. This is something that we just did at this point, but at the time, this was a, a gigantic leap for us to take. So I want to revisit this um, quote, find where your greatest talents and the world's greatest needs meet. So we're thinking of this as a, a how to describe this passion-based career path that we're on. Um, it took us a while to hear this quote, but once we heard it, kind of describe what we were doing and help kind of focus our efforts even. Um, we, we took the things that we did best and applied that energy to the things that we were most passionate or concerned about and learned how to make a living doing that. We're really still pretty early in that career, but we're finding ourselves settling into a, a niche that we've created for ourselves. So we keep saying conservation storytelling is what we do, but what do we mean by that? So there's lots of storytellers out there doing amazing work, telling beautiful stories, but we have a, a different skill set. Um, that's unique to us a little bit. And that's to decipher what our science and conservation professionals are talking about, and then turn that into something that's easily digestible to a viewer. There's so much at stake within the field of conservation that if you're actually able to tap into that story, it makes for something that's really compelling, a story that really matters. But often you have to tease out a story from a pretty science heavy topic. And so that's a big part of our job. Something that I learned in college while reading scientific papers and articles is that scientists are really great at communicating to other scientists, but generally um, not so great at communicating to the general public. And that's the goal of science is to get your work peer reviewed. So the main, main audience must be other scientists and that's the way it should be. We saw our job as being sort of a bridge between that scientific community and the general public to take the message from the research and the work they're doing and try to distill it down, sort through the jargon and organize the information in a way that can resonate with, with anyone really. So we need to communicate what's at stake, what needs to be done. Uh, so a lot of our work is really jotting down notes on a Zoom call or working to decipher what they're talking about through research or more importantly, asking them the right questions. Um, so our work is really bringing the level of communication to um, a level it could resonate with anyone. And the other part of that is that we're, we're storytellers. And so we strive to find story within that science heavy subject matter. We wanna find a way to insert humanity into, to, into a project, find out who interacts with the resources, 
what's their connection to the work being done or the issue at hand. And we're striving to find characters, people who find themselves in the wild, people who have unique perspectives or have unique experiences with nature, people who research the small interactions in our natural world that might have major implications for our future. So these characters are sometimes unassuming. Sometimes they don't see themselves as characters or never uh, really felt like many people cared about what they do on a day-to-day -day basis in the field. We like to make heroes out of these people and um, highlight the work that they do. So we wanted to share a couple of uh, our favorite characters that we've got to work with over the years. So this is Heidi Trudell. She's self-appointed herself as the dead bird girl. So her free time is consumed with surveying the ground around buildings for dead birds and stuffing her home freezer full of uh, specimens and documenting that. And her, her mission is to bring awareness to the issue of window collision. So she's documenting where collisions happen and writing reports and giving architectural rec recommendations or um, behavioral recommendations, you know, turning lights off during migration in big buildings or adding window clings to um, reflective surfaces that might be problematic. She's, she's the one out there actually seeing the devastation happening and, and kind of putting a spotlight on it. And it's really important work. Another character who uh, had an impact on us was Yu Man Lee. She's a conservation scientist who specializes on reptiles and amphibians in Michigan um, and really on the habitat that's needed to sustain these creatures. So you man um, and our time that we spent with her, she offered a view into the weird world of vernal pools, something that we didn't know much about, something we had heard about. Um, but spending a day with her, we we really learned a lot, and the importance that these play on species that we rarely see, like frogs and salamanders. Um, and we learned about other species we didn't even know existed, like fairy shrimp. So. Working with her put into perspective something that is in our own backyard that is um, so important to these species. You know, these creatures would not exist without these habitat and the landscapes, and people need to be out there um, advocating for them. And so, you man really did that for us. Anna Buckhart Thomas and her husband Bill uh, joined us to film just a couple days after getting married. So, they're skipping their honeymoon on purpose so that Anna didn't miss the start of her field season. So Anna studies the declining golden-winged warbler populations by using a technology called geolocators. So we, we can't observe the entire intercontinental migration of birds and warblers are just too small for GPS units. So she uses this really tiny light meter that can be put on a bird in order to read the daylight that the bird experiences every day and you can get a, a latitude and longitude for where it's been. Um, but you need to recover that geolocator to get the data. So the day we spent with her, she did recover a geolocator. That was the one that she recovered for that entire field season. And so it just really shows the dedication and sort of the creative problem solving and the resilience that is needed to understand something as difficult to study as migratory um, bird habitat and, and populations. And so, um, when we worked with her, we, we became really thankful for some of the work that goes on behind the scenes. And it, it felt really good to highlight some of that work. Another person we had a, a great experience with was Sean Howard. He's a commercial fisherman in Munising, Michigan. And commercial fishing is a pretty rugged business, especially on Lake Superior. And there's a consumptive nature to fishing that might make you think that Sean's work is goes against a uh, sustainable native fish population in the Great Lakes, but him and his crew are actually using their vessel um, on the side to venture into the cold and dangerous waters of Lake Superior in the winter to try to access some spawning grounds of some fish that um, they're researching. They're, they're part of research project to try and restore populations of native fish in the Great Lakes. So. It was a, a surprising story and, and one that took us into a, a really great adventure to be out on the lake with these uh, fishermen and see what they do on a daily basis. 
one of the major perks of our work is the things that we get to learn on each project. So we get to become armchair experts on a new subject uh, for a few months as we're bringing a new project to life. So we, we've come to know a little bit about a lot of different areas in conservation ecology. And these are the things that are really needed to solve some of the issues that we're advocating for and that we really care about. Things like um, researching migratory songbird habitat and, and, uh, and the research to conserve them. What happens with the native fisheries in our Great Lakes? And we've done specific deep dives on the spawning reefs um, in our Great Lakes. We've done work in forest management and how fire ecology drives our landscape. Uh, prairie conservation. We learned about salamander reproduction, as you heard with our, our work with UMAN. We've learned what it takes to uh, manage and protect some of our largest rivers, rivers as large as the Mississippi River. What, we learned what it takes to protect land and what goes into land preservation and protecting our favorite places on the landscape. We've learned about hydraulic connectivity in our rivers and, and how that sustains fish population. And we learned what you can do on the landscape to manage the land to protect sensitive species like the brook trout. And we've done uh, deep dives into how to measure the health of, of a tree. We've also learned a lot about invasive species, whether terrestrial on our, our hiking trails or invasive species kind of wreaking havoc in our Great Lakes, the aquatic invasive species. So these are just a few of the deep dives that we've been able to do over the years. Um, and these are the things that are necessary to reverse extinction or keep our water clean or generally create a planet that can sustain life. These types of projects are things that people don't generally hear about on a daily basis, but we think that people need to be thinking about these things. They at least need to understand them. Um, but really, if we can get people to connect with them, um, they can support this work and, and help drive conservation um, forward. And we wouldn't be fauna creative if we didn't capture images of species. We've had the opportunity to capture some endangered species like the Great Lakes population of piping plovers. We've captured some really threatened and endangered butterfly species like the Carner Blue butterfly that's kind of hanging on by a thread in some of the southern portions of Michigan. We've filmed the red cockaded woodpecker that had a brush with extinction. Uh, this population was down to nine breeding pairs before the work that we highlighted uh, in our, our video started. Um, we filmed species that are, are less rare to see or less not as endangered, but they're, they're rare to see. And then we capture things that you see maybe more often, but we try to capture them in, in an exciting way and, and view them up, up close. Species are really at the core of the work that we do and of the projects that our film subjects are engaged in. So if we can capture images of species that are really exciting to see, this goes a long way in establishing the connections that we're after with our work, the connections with our viewers that make them act um, to become involved in conservation. So we have tools to capture these species. We have underwater housing and scuba gear. We have long lenses for things that are far away. We have macro lenses for things that are really close up and we have camera stabilization that can help us sort of move at the speed of nature. And we really don't forget about the flora either. We spend a lot of time laying on the ground. Um, this world is so beautifully and wonderfully diverse. If you can get out there and have a species encounter or if you spend time on the ground and you are soaking in the tiny, tiny details that you find, that's when you're connected to nature. And we realize that not everyone has that opportunity to do this. Um, and if they do, they don't get to do it on a regular basis. So we think that we can create connections in the next best way through the use of film and photography and storytelling. Ultimately, we think that if we as humans can figure out how to keep these species around for future generations to see and enjoy in the same way that we have, and we think that we as a species are doing something right, but that future really isn't fully tangible at that point. And generally things are trending in the wrong direction for many groups of plants and animals. So 
this mission of keeping species around into the future is really an uphill battle. And there's a lot of conservation conservation scientists working to tackle these important issues and they've been doing it for decades. Um, we think that we have a, a role we can play in this effort. And the job is to connect more people to nature, to get more people to understand what's important, understand what's under threat and understand what we need to do to protect it. And we think that story can do that. And with that, um, Chris would like to share a couple of things about how we do the work that we do. And so um, I'm gonna pass it off to him and he has a bunch of camera gear behind him. And so he can talk a little bit about the technical side of conservation storytelling. Thanks for that, Jason. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, once again, I'm Chris Zucker, Director of Photography and uh, Editor for Fauna Creative. Um, I just want to say thanks again for coming out virtually and um, thanks to M&A again for giving us a platform to share a little bit about ourselves. Um, most of the time we're telling stories about others, so it's kind of a cool opportunity to share our story. So, yeah, now that Jason's uh, kind of gone through um, what, who we are and what we do, I'm just going to do a quick run through some of our uh, tools we use, tools of the trade for um, any of the gearheads out in the audience. Um, so yeah, some of you may be interested in like the imaging and photography stuff. So here's a look into some of our gear that we use. Um, so first is what we call the A camera um, right here. It's the um, Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K. Uh, it's made by a company called Black Magic Design. Uh, it's just been an absolute workout course for us. Um, I'd say about 90% of the images we, we use are captured with this camera right here. Um, it shoots in 4.6K resolution. Um, we typically just shoot in 4K. Uh, it's just plenty, plenty for our purposes. And um, it allows us to like crop in on shots uh, in post or um, gives us a little flexibility with stabilizing footage, things like that. Um, it's mostly set up with the uh, Sigma 18 to 35 uh, zoom lens. Um, it's just a good focal length for the, the handheld style uh, that we like to, to use. Um, you saw obviously a lot of that um, in the previous part with Jason. Um, it's just a good style for us. It gives us kind of a nice organic floaty feel. Um, uh, and it also just allows us to be nimble when we're out in the field um, rather than carrying around like a tripod or some other clunky stable, stabilization rings, rigs that exist out there. Um, it keeps us nimble. Um, you know, other types of things can kind of slow you down when you're trying to bushwhack, for example, or just get, you know, a couple miles out on a trail. Um, so this is just the way we like to roll right here. So, um, and to, to support this thing, um, we use something called an easy rig. Um, and you saw some pictures of us uh, wearing this thing early on in the presentation. Um, it's right back here. It's a, a vest with a little boom that kind of goes out over your head. And then there's a spring loaded cable that uh, holds all the way to the camera. Um, so that just relieves a ton of stress off our arms and our back, um, just allows us to shoot basically all day without feeling any kind of strain. Um, the camera is about 20 pounds fully built. So um, the vest has just been invaluable for us. It's uh, made my life a lot easier. I got to say it's probably the best, one of the best investments uh, we've probably made. Um, so yeah, from there, um, there's our B camera. Um, and we'd like to call it our wildlife setup because it's usually set up with this big old lens right here. Um, it's a, sometimes we put the little, this camera body right here, it's a black magic pocket 6K. Uh, sometimes we put it on a gimbal um, just for some like motivated, smooth, uh, moving motion type shots. But we typically just have a setup like this um, with the 60 to 600 Sigma. Um, telephoto lens. Um, we just like to have it set up like this uh, so we can kind of take it into the woods. Um, that's usually the planned out stuff is going into the woods with it and uh, kind of sitting and staking out and waiting for things to kind of show up. Um, but sometimes uh, when you see wildlife, it's, you know, the times you just aren't prepared to capture it. Um, a lot of times it's, uh, you know, we're driving down the road in the UP and all of a sudden there's uh, bunch of grouse coming across the road so you just got to be ready we keep this thing in the, the tripod out of the bag so we can jump out of the van quick and 
pop it on there on the side of the road and hopefully get lucky. Um, and we have a few times. So uh, some of the, the coolest shots are in those opportunistic moments like that. Um, the 600 millimeters just, um, it's a great focal length, keeps us, you know, you can stay far away from whatever you're trying to shoot, uh, avoid being detected, uh, give you a little better chance to capture some of the um, natural, you know, um, uh, habits of, of whatever fauna we may be shooting. Um, and on top of having 600 millimeters, this little camera shoots in 6K resolution, which is crazy. Just, it shoots higher resolution than this one. Um, so that allows us to crop in on an image. Um, so an image you shot at 600 millimeters, that's a really, really close up image. And when you're able to crop in even further, that makes for just a crazy intimate shot with, of, with something, you know, maybe a small animal like a warbler. Um, it's typically, you can only get so close to them, um, but this allows us to get that really tight shot of them, um, which is really cool. It's a, a look that you get at something that small that you typically can't really get. So um, just a really great combination for, for our wildlife capture stuff. Um, and then the other lens we really like to use on that camera is this guy right here. And it may not look like a camera lens at all. Um, it's called a probe lens. So it's a specialty macro lens. Um, it's got this long skinny shape, so it allows us to get into like nooks and crannies and get some details in, you know, like the understory of a forest, for example, um, that you just couldn't capture with a traditional macro lens. Um, it's also waterproof, so you can dip it in the water. Um, uh, you saw some footage of the fairy shrimp earlier, um, which you're about to see in a, we're going to show you that film here in a little bit. Um, so, uh, just a really cool, uh, tool to get in there and see things that you just really can't see with any other type of lens. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of fun shooting with that thing. Um, then there's the tool that a lot of people are really familiar with these days is the drone. Um, we have the DJI Mavic 2 Pro. Um, Jason is our part 107 certified drone pilot. Um, so he's always doing the flying for us. Um, it's small, compact, folds up nice, um, which is great. A lot of times we're just hiking in somewhere and you just want to keep the bulk and the weight down so you could really i mean you could slip it in your pocket if you really wanted to um uh, but it is large you know large enough and powerful enough to cut through some wind or you know you know treacherous elements or whatever to to keep a steady flight and keep those camera moves nice and stable so it's just that nice medium compact but strong and it's got some some power um you know, just uh, drones are just a really valuable tool that's kind of come up in the last uh, 10 years or so that um, it's just an awesome tool that's really accessible now and uh, allows you to get some, you know, great landscapes that, you know, from higher perspectives that you, you know, it's the only way to do places justice sometimes is to see it from that bird's eye view. Um, and then there is our underwater housing, um, which I don't have here with me. Uh, it's at Jason's place right now. But, um, you know, we're Michigan based, we're shooting in the Great Lakes quite often, as you saw in the footage earlier as well. Um, so it's an essential tool for us. Um, you know, a lot of conservation is out on the lakes and there's underwater elements involved. And so this allows us and specifically Jason to get down there and actually see what's going on. Um, he's uh, scuba certified as well. He's kind of our specialty guy. He's got these, uh, little certifications that allow us to get into these places and, you know, fly and then go, you know, below the water. Um, so it's, um, it's just another one of those specialty skills and uh, pieces of equipment that, you know, allows us to get some really cool imagery. Um, then we have our photo camera here, which is, if any of you photographers out there, um, if you're familiar with Canon, you probably heard of the 5D. This is a 5D Mark IV. Um, it's classic body if you're you know photography um we've shot on 5ds for a long time so since the mark ii which is i mean i don't know how when that came out but it's been a while um it's just something that we're really comfortable with shooting on and although it's an older series of camera um it's just we know it's been battle tested you know it's it can handle being in these tough conditions and uh it can take a little beating you know i mean if we're getting into some places that um you know <laughs> this camera I mean, all of our gear takes a bit of a beating. So um, you got to have things that can withstand that type of stuff. Um, 
it's, you know, it may be an old camera, but it still puts out a really great image. Um, and we've just been really happy with, with the 5Ds or a, a 5D bunch here. So, um, and we don't do quite as much photography. Um, we really do specialize in film, filmmaking and video, but, you know, photo is an essential tool and it really does, it allows us to tell stories in a different medium when we need to. Um, and a lot of our clients, you know, you know, something that they typically will want, we'll, we'll attack it on the a package deal or something. So, um, and the last tool, which is um, really important as well, um, it's the editing software we use. Um, you know, we like to say a lot of the magic happens in the edit. Um, it's, you know, the, the place you have the opportunity to set the tone and, you know, really bring a story to life. So I'd say for every hour we're out shooting on a project, um, there's probably double of that, of me sitting here in this spot right here, um, editing a piece together. Um, you know, I, I love being on site and I love shooting. It's great, you know, learning about all this stuff and, you know, meeting these awesome people and just seeing all the cool stuff that's going on. Um, but for me, I think the most gratification really does come from um, when you see that vision, you know, coming together in a timeline and having the control of, you know, how to tell that story. Um, it's just something that I've always enjoyed and I still do. Um, probably my favorite aspect of production. Um, just, you know, seeing that story you set out to tell just come together. It's just really cool. Um, and so, yeah, th those are just some of our favorite storytelling tools. Um, there's plenty more in the bag. We just don't have time to show you all of them. So, um, yeah, with all that, um, I'll turn it back to Jason here and uh, he'll introduce uh, the first of the two films we're going to show you tonight. So thank you. Yeah, so. We want to share a little bit of our story, but we, we're really excited to share the work. Um, and um, we hope that the, the films play well in this digital uh, streaming format. So we're going to show a couple pieces that we've done. And the first one we're going to show is um, work that we've done with Michigan Nature Association. And we gave a few spoilers away in the presentation because it, 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 there's um, some interesting characters involved in it, but this is the, the project that features Yu Man Lee. Um, and so the film is called Ephemeral, and I am going to try and share my screen here. And we're going to try to see how this works to share some films with you. So we're going to show two films tonight. This is the shorter of the two. Um, and we're gonna see how this goes. Do full screen. Um, so yeah, this is the film Ephemeral. I usually describe it as sort of like a kid in a candy shop. You take your dip net and you scoop a couple times. We first look and it just looks like there's just specks of dirt. And then you look closer and then you realize those specks are moving around and swimming and stuff. And then you start to see all this life in the pool, even with just, you know, one or two scoops of this little aquarium net. You'll find them, you know, just bursting with all these species and then a couple weeks later they're gone. And so I think of them as being these really magical places. Vernal pools have been referred to by some as the coral reefs of northern forests. Just like coral reefs, they're thought of as keystone ecosystems because of the critical role that they play for a number of these different species. It may just look like a mud puddle. It may just look like this pond that just kind of dries out. But there's a lot more going on in these ponds that you may not see. It's actually really critically important to a whole bunch of creatures. There are four in Michigan that we consider to be vernal pool indicator or obligate species that either only occur in vernal pools or really depend on them for their survival. Those are fairy shrimp, wood frogs, spotted salamanders, and blue spotted salamanders. There's many examples within biology of things you can't see that are taking place. I mean, there's nothing quite as exciting as, as like pulling out this trap that's just filled with you know, all these salamanders kind of writhing around. Because you encounter them so rarely in the greater environment, it's kind of fun to be able to see so many all in one place. 
There have been studies done where they have found the abundance of salamanders in forests to be more abundant than even some of the insects. So they're a really important part of the food web and part of the ecosystem. You have this one chance to see them so concentrated in one area. You know, in a couple of days, they'll be headed back into this environment and uh, go about their lives eating, you know, the little creatures they find underneath the ground and in logs. In a year from now, they'll be ready to party and head back on down to the ponds and we'll get a chance to see them again. I want people to find value in these things that may not look like they have that much value. Without these ponds, you know, these salamanders can't survive. Some of these frogs can't survive. It may not look like much, but they're important. So wherever we can conserve them, wherever we can protect them and the areas around them, we can also protect these unique species. All right, so that was ephemeral. How did that work? Did it look good? A little bit of chop, but if we turn off all our video feeds on the next one, it'll be a little smoother. Okay. Zoom can be difficult. <laughs> cool, so, so that was a sneak peek of ephemeral. So I hope you enjoyed that. The next film we want to show is called The Fight for Flight. This is a film that we made um, for ourselves. This is our, our first sort of dabble into passion project territory. So something that didn't have um, a budget tied to it or anything like that. Something we made out of our, our pocket. And um, it is a film about the migratory um, birds that interact with the Great Lakes each spring and fall and the people that interact with them. So we were really interested in looking for stories that uh, we're in our own backyard, but could be worthy of sort of National Geographic type uh, coverage. And so this thing that happens every year sort of behind the scenes is really phenomenal and, and spectacular. If you know where to look and, and know when to look and some of the things that you see if you go birding in, in May and Michigan um, are just incredible. And so we wanted to put a spotlight on that. We thought that a lot of our peers um, didn't appreciate this phenomenon or didn't even know much about it. And so that's why we made the fight for flight. And so we wanna show you this. So this is a 15 minute film. Um, it's a little bit longer. Um, so sit back and enjoy the fight for flight. I can tell you about an episode when I was five years old that changed my mind about birds. And I remember this story distinctly. My brother and I, we were throwing stones at birds and a woman, she stopped and she said, don't throw stones at birds, they're your friends. She said she was gonna come back the next day with a book. She did come back the next day and I still have the book. From that point on, my brother and I started naming the species and figuring out what they were and counting how many we saw, and uh, I still do that. <laughs> I, still, I still count birds, and that woman, who I don't know her name, really changed my life. These lands and these species, there's a moral responsibility to take care of them, to be concerned about their quality, and about their future. There's a lot of beauty in these woods, and I hope my great-great-grandchildren can experience the same thing that I do today.
Every year, twice a year, once in spring, once in fall, millions of birds are passing overhead through the woods. They tend to be unnoticed, perhaps, running through our daily lives. We, we miss this truly global phenomenon of migration. And they're moving from Central America or northern part of South America, and they move north in these mass migrations. And they're moving up to breeding grounds, all the way up into Canada. These birds can travel two or three hundred miles in a night. It's really quite phenomenal. When they come upon the Great Lakes, they look for wooded areas particularly, where they can hide and feed and rest up for their next move. These birds need to fly through this area. They don't have another choice. They don't have anywhere else to go. We have an opportunity here in the Great Lakes really to protect forest for these migratory birds. And I think we have a responsibility uh, to do that. My name is Anna Buckart Thomas. I'm a graduate student at the University of Maine. I go out in the field and I'm looking for golden wing warblers. Um, so the golden wing warbler does a bee buzz buzz, um, really buzzy kind of song. There's one singing right over there. Golden wing warblers are experiencing steep declines. They've lost about 60% of their population in the last 50 years. And it's partially thought to be because of um, a loss of their necessary habitat and their breeding ground. But there's other factors involved, especially these things about what happens during migration and what the habitat is like in the wintering. And so we need to really fully understand that whole life cycle to be able to hopefully reverse that decline and make sure that they have a stable population moving forward. Got them. That guy's unbanded, so not the bird we're hoping for, or looking for. Still a golden wing, but... Yep, no bands. Let's find another one. That one's singing nicely, but he is not our guy. We have to find the ones, that, that single one that has the device on it, to be able to get any information back. This is only possible because golden wing warblers have pretty high sight fidelity, so the males will return to the same territory or same general area. After they've flown all the way to Central or South America and all the way back, they still can find that same patch of trees. So yeah, we have to be thorough in our searching, but it's possible to find them again. It's like back that way. Okay, let's I'm go find them. Go after that one? Yeah. I actually got married like four days ago, um, and instead of a honeymoon, I dragged my new husband up here with me to do my field work. So he's my technician this summer, um, and we're out here waking up at four in the morning, going out to find birds, and this is what he does also. I mean, he's a wildlife ecologist, but to be able to share this with a person you really value and the things that you really value, it's really cool to be able to be out here and do it together. There's a golden wing. I think it's that bands on the oak back there. There are bands for sure. Do you see any colors? Knowing that there's a banded bird here, I think our best bet is to set up some nets and use the playback on actually catching him. Yeah. And if we catch a bird that doesn't have a geo, it's okay. Yeah. We know very little about migration because it's so transient. It's this period that's two or three months of the year, but they're moving. A person can't track a moving bird. And until recently, we haven't had technology that's small enough to track these birds. Um, but now that we do, we're learning things about all different sorts of birds. What I use is called a geolocator. It's a light level archival tag that just takes data on the daylight, basically. And from that, you can extrapolate the longitude and latitude, which then gives you kind of a sense of where the bird is all year. That'll work. We're trying to get a golden wing warbler, but it looks like we caught an American red start instead. That happens sometimes you catch the wrong bird. So we're just going to get it out of the net. So this is a male American red start. They live in the same kind of habitat a golden wing warbler is found in. But we're not interested in this guy today. 
So we're just gonna check real quick for evidence of breeding. He is a breeding male. So we'll add that to the Wisconsin Breeding Bird Atlas for their data, um, and then we'll set this guy in his way. There he goes. And now we'll head back over and let this net keep hopefully attracting golden wings. There's so few people that do dead bird work that I feel kind of obligated. I want to focus my efforts on areas that are understudied, underserved, and in this case it's birds that hit windows. Anything that dies an artificial death, I figure should go to science. Window strikes generally provide really good specimens because they're less mangled than from a cat or a car, you know, things like that. Every season, all of our stuff gets documented. We take the data and we present it to either architects, building owners, building managers, uh, the general public. And we, of course, do our end of season photo shoot. I'm gonna hand you some warblers first because I'm okay. still identifying those guys. But this guy, eat your heart out. Oh. Yeah. Color is just, yeah. yeah. just phenomenal. When you have them in the hand, you can look at the tiny, tiny details just, just wow, you know. Yeah. Just to see how tiny they are and how, like, that little thing goes, you know, from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico, crosses the Gulf in one straight shot. It, it's mind blowing. I've been doing this long enough that my my dead bird radar is pretty well honed. <laughs> I can look at a building and look at a calendar and pretty much predict how much I'm going to find when and where. Migration is incredibly challenging for birds. As humans create more and more obstacles for them, it becomes more difficult for birds to pass those obstacles. And so by identifying when and where those pressures are occurring, we can make things slightly easier for them. Safe passage looks to prevent as much unintentional human-caused mortality of birds as possible. So herbicides, pesticides, cats, cars, wind turbines, buildings, daytime, nighttime strikes, it's just anything that we can do to help people make our environment safer for birds. You can kind of tell when you pick up a dead bird if it died immediately or not. And the ones that are just completely sprawled out, that's kind of how they fell. It's really sad when they look peaceful because they were just probably lying there not feeling so good. This is why I have a fantastic therapist. I had to do some therapist shopping when I moved up here because like the first, Three, four, we're like, this dead bird thing, this sounds like a problem. Like, no, actually the dead birds are not a problem. The things that are killing the birds are the problem. <laughs> so, yeah. But it's hard, it's hard. Rehab comes in because it's basically the only way to save a bird. If a bird crashes into something, it's going to end up suffering. It's not a guarantee that it's going to cut out of a head collision and have no injuries. So if a bird hits something, they need to be brought in for us, and that's why we are here, to help this bird, to rehab it, to get it better, to get it back out there. Because if that bird goes out there and it's not 100%, it either can re-injure itself or be at risk for a predator to eat it. It's definitely a rewarding job. It's a hard job. It's a stressful job. It's a lot going on. Oh, bird out. <laughs> we take care of close to anywhere from 1,200 to 1,300 birds a year. We are busy feeding birds every 30 minutes to 45 minutes. And in the center at one time, there can be anywhere from 100 to 150 birds. Baby blues. <laughs> 
we all work really, really well together and really talk about our mission, and that's to rescue rehab and release as many birds as possible. So I'm gonna let the cedar wax wing out, you guys. So well, here's our wax wing, and I'm going to just release him down here and see how he does. I'm seeing that his right wing is hanging low, which it wasn't doing as much before. So that's something that is going to be a concern for me. The DNR law states we have to have two wings, two feet, two two eyes, everything to be able to migrate and fly. And that is important. They migrate and fly a very, very long way. So if they have any kind of wing issues, it's not benefit for them. And then you have to make that decision. So I guess that would definitely be the hardest part of the job is knowing that a bird looks okay, but is not. The collision birds, I'm very passionate about them. To see them be able to be released is the best part because they often come in just so injured and you don't know if they're gonna make it and when they pull through, that's, that's the reward. And to see them fly off and be able to live their life again, you know, that's what makes it work. You get in some of these birds that really touch your heart and their stories and you want just what's best for them and that, that's kind of where I'm at. So we caught a pair of golden wing warbler, a female and a male. And this male has the geolocator on it, so it's been collecting data for a year. So this is amazing. So the birds I work with are nine grams or less, and the tracking devices have to be very, very lightweight. In general, rule of thumb, you, you can't put a device on a bird that's more than 5% of their body weight. The geolocators that I use are less than half a gram. So here's the geolocator, it's on his back. It's been collecting light level data for the past year. We'll cut one side of the harness. Cut the other, and there we go, we have our first geolocator. Okay, now we can put him in a bag and we'll process him as long as the weather holds. We'll get this female out quick. So this is the female golden wing warbler. It's exciting to catch both, especially this time of year when the females are nesting, you don't see them as much. Every little piece of the puzzle to understand how that phenomenon works is just really key to being able to do as much as we can for the wildlife that we're impacting on a daily basis. We don't have all the answers. We don't know everything. We are all creating this body of knowledge that's informing us on what's the best thing to do to help these birds. When Aldo Leopold was talking about community, he's not just talking the human community, you know, he's talking uh, these birds, these salamanders, you know, the deer, that's all community members. And we have to hope that our species understands that we are truly just part of this community. And we have a responsibility to our fellow community members to maintain a condition where they can survive. If we don't take the responsibility to care for these lands seriously, we'll lose them. We'll lose them. I mean, it's simple as that. We'll abuse them and we will lose them. Responsibility is, is a big part of our life on Earth. We really have to take a hold of that opportunity now. While the habitat is here and while there's an opportunity to restore habitat where we can, we have to do that. That was the fight for flight. I hope it worked smoothly for everybody. Um, now is our chance to um, answer some questions. I see a lot in the side over there. I don't know if Lauren has been curating um, 
questions or we got we're, you. we're gonna sort through and, and yep. so. we're gonna so yeah we now I'll, I'll introduce um julie stoneman our director of outreach and education has been on with us as well so she's gonna um go through the questions with you guys um and also i want to note um it looked like we did have a little bit of a playback issue um if, if you guys want to watch the full um Fight for Flight video it is available on Fauna Creative's website at faunacreative.com. Um, that website is in the chat box. And Julie, go ahead with the questions. Yeah, and I just want to say I, I could watch um, your stuff all day. So Jason and Chris, and for the folks in the audience, uh, we've been working with Fauna Creative now for the past um, eight months, perhaps, and um, they're a joy to work with. So. Uh, Zoom is not the best place to present uh, some of the, the terrific video. Uh, these guys are award winners. They recently won uh, an award at the Fresh Coast um, Film Festival, the best short story. I think it was best short film. So we're looking forward to the day when we can all get back together and gather together and we'll invite um, Chris and Jason back to, to, to share some of their work on the big screen. So down the line. Uh, but Elise had a question early on and she said, she asked it, um, Jason, you said you have to tease out the story from the science. Do you guys have scientific backgrounds or are you able to get the story by asking questions and, and doing research? Sure, so I actually have a, a biology background. I went to Michigan State for environmental biology and zoology. So this is, I spent more time studying science and I did photography. So I, I also went to Lansing Community College for a two year photography degree. So melding the two together to, to try and do some scientific storytelling. So yeah, I, I speak scientists a little bit um, and just kind of keep it going. Every project keeps that uh, that side of my brain moving. And, and then Chris also, a lot of the projects we work on, he has an outdoors background and, and everything. And so together we kind of tease out the science side of things and he can kind of uh, pull me back towards, uh, you know, less science heavy type thing if I'm getting too into the weeds and nerdy. So I think we have a good balance of interpreting the message and trying to bring it to life, I guess. So yeah, there is a science background in, in how we tell our stories. And then um, Elise, also wanted to know how, how do you find your stories? Sure. So the majority of the work that we do is contract based. So we work with a number of different nonprofits like uh, MNA. And so there's people coming to us with projects, things that they want to communicate to other people. And um, this is really the, the leap that we took to, to become Fauna. We are doing a lot of this work um, before we worked at Bigfoot Media in Chicago and, and during, and, and this is the sort of specialization time that we, about four years ago, really started to specialize and we're seeing more and more um, benefits from that and people coming to us because we do what we do. So a lot of our projects come to us and, and that's the project, but then we do the digging to try and find out who can help tell that story. And a lot of times our partners that we work with know the people on the ground or know the right people to ask. So we're, we're really trying to steer the conversation in the right way to kind of bring that, that section of a, the presentation was about getting humanity into the, the science heavy project. So figuring out who are the characters that we can illustrate the concept so that people connect with it. So um, it's a little bit of digging. You do a little bit of Googling and looking at who has done a media article or, or whatever, or you ask around. And so there's, there's sometimes the stories come to you and other times you spend a lot of time digging. So Fight for Flight is a great example of, of we didn't have many things come to us and it just was phone call after phone call. And you know, we really set out to set, tell a story about um, the research side of things that, that migration puzzle is fascinating to me, how we don't know much about it. And all this technology is kind of getting smaller and smaller where it, doors are opening. And so the research side is where we started and really wanted to go. And we didn't have as many um, stories come to us. And honestly, we were really late in the season when we were doing it. So we caught a little bit 
of those birds that were nesting, not necessarily migrating. And through that, we found other sides of the story that we weren't even knowing we were looking for. So the window collisions and the rehab were just things that came out of conversations. And I think that they added something unexpected to that story that um, gave it some heart and soul. So yeah, hopefully that answers that question. <laughs> It, it does. And, and by the way, you're getting lots of kudos in chat. And uh, we'll, we'll keep going here for a few more minutes yet because we've got a couple more, got some more questions. And if you've anybody listening in who has a question, please put them in the question and answer box. That would be great. Um, could you remind us again, who, who said that awesome quote, find where your greatest talent? Um, that was uh, from a podcast. Um, we, we listen to a lot of podcasts on the road. We spend a, a lot of time in the car. So um, uh, the podcast was Wild Fed with a guy named Daniel Vitalis. It's, uh, it's about um, basically wild foods and, you know, hunting and gathering type stuff and the philosophy behind that. Um, he has, you know, all sorts of different guests that come on and talk about, you know, foraging for whatever mushrooms or, you know, whatever flora, he, you know, people are digging into and, uh, you know, fish, fishermen, and, you know, all these different people that are out there collecting wild foods um, in whatever way. I wish I could remember the episode and the person who said that quote, but um, yeah, we'd have to dig that one up. Uh, but it's a great, a great podcast. I would recommend it if you're into that, that kind of stuff. Um, it's cool, cool to hear some of those stories. That's right. I tried to see if there's like a name or some sort of attribution to that quote, but it was somebody, I think it was just a forager on that podcast. I'm like, wow, that, yeah. that really, uh, you know, works with what we're, we're doing kind of helps focus what we want to do. So nails it. Um, Betsy would like to know how might someone reach mm -hmm. you to discuss a potential project? So What's the best way to get hold of you guys? Sure. <laughs> so faunacreative.com is the, our website. There's a contact us uh, section on the page. So that'd be the easiest way to do it. And if you're looking for more work, um, other films to see and, and um, some of these films too, to see them the way they're supposed to be watched in a smooth uh, playback, then uh, head there and, and watch some of our work. That's sort of our portfolio. And what advice would you give to someone just beginning in conservation filmmaking? Hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> um, get, get, get out there and do, do things. You know, we're, now we both have uh, little ones at home and it's becoming harder and harder to get out there between the work that we do to go and do a project. So don't take any sort of free time for granted. Get out there and just do something. Um, so that's, I, I think that's for any creative out there, doing things is the best way to advance your craft. And so if you do something, you learn what you did wrong on that one, or you learn what you did right. And, and at the end of the day, you have something to show for it. And so the best advice for, for any creative really is to do things. And if you're in, in conservation, do the things that you care about most. Um, and so talk to somebody, usually if someone wants to share their story and often uh, the people that we talk to, the researchers, scientists don't, don't um, have people asking them questions that aren't in, in their field. So um, they're always open to share. And um, another question from Elise, what, what brought you to the red cockaded woodpecker story? And have you done other stories outside of Michigan? Yeah, we do a lot of work out of Michigan. Um, actually, our, our relationship with Michigan Nature Association this year has really brought us back to our home state. And it's been really exciting to be um, working in places that we, we know. And so a lot of our projects have, have been outside. Uh, you know, this year we've been in Minnesota and Texas and Arkansas and North Carolina. Um, and then we've had our Michigan trip. So this was a project with uh, the U.S. Forest Service. So that's in uh, the, the Washita National Forest in, in Arkansas and stretches a little bit into Oklahoma. And so they're um, 
their work there is really centered around the red cockaded woodpecker to um, restore some of the forests there. The, the issue was fire suppression. Um, over time, we stopped. We got really good at fighting fires and trying to grow our forest back. And the, the thicket of the forest is bad for woodpeckers. And so the Endangered Species Act helped push the work forward to create habitat suitable for this invasive species. And the interesting part of that story is by doing that work for the woodpecker, there's dozens of other species that they didn't know were gonna have some benefits there. So you almost created a prairie within the forest and all the pollinators and birds and everything came to it. So fascinating work that we were not so familiar with before we started a lot of fire and prescribed burning um, going into that needed to open up the, the forest so that the, the woodpecker has suitable habitat. And so there's a lot more to talk about with this, but hopefully that's a, a little uh, taste. Uh, and thanks, Chris, for answering Greg's question about the video camera, the smaller one that you use. Um, so I, I just have a question because I'm totally in awe of what you guys do, especially since you have two big unknowns. Oftentimes when you go out in a shoot, you have these scheduled, you really can't uh, break away from the schedule because of other work, but you've got weather, you've got wildlife. So how, how do you plan or not plan for both of those factors? Sure. Um, well, weather is, it is a tough one and I, I mean you just have to roll with it and so we have gear to waterproof so if it is a downpour and there's no other way to do it they, we can bag up that big ursa camera behind chris and and put it in and we've shot a full day in the rain and have gotten what we needed to get and that's one way to do it you you have to wait it out if you want or you just hope for the best and work around it um and so we just we like to roll with it and sometimes we've we've had you know a 10 hour drive and a you know 80 percent rain forecast and we're like we have to roll with it and we get there and it's beautiful we have sun poking through and we had an excellent day and so you can't always rely on the, the forecast um so we do a lot of rolling with it and seeing what happens and, and wildlife you can't control obviously and i think the best um way we look at it is just being out there being out there at the right time we do a lot of sunrise work if we're being hired to go shoot we're we're not sleeping through the sunrise because that's when the best light is that's when the best opportunities for uh wildlife are so if you're out there with the camera you get lucky and things will things will present themselves and that, that's different from looking to capture like a lynx or uh you know a mountain lion or something like that there's things out there that require sitting in a blind and doing all that um but in terms of capturing warblers and um birds and hawks and things like that just being out there gives you that opportunity and if, if you're not out there you're not going to capture it so yeah lots of luck out there. is involved <laughs> for sure <laughs> yes mm -hmm. and it's not always comfortable um <laughs> yeah, we were shooting yesterday and the last two days in 45 mile an hour winds in minnesota so if we look a little wind burn that's that's why but yeah, fight through it. <laughs> well, um, again, I, I, that's the end of the questions that I can see. And I just want to thank you guys again for, um, for working with us, um, but sharing your passion, your creativity, your skills. Um, and for our audience, Fauna Creative is working on four separate videos for us, plus the ephemeral one that you saw a bit of so there will be lots of um, lots of films for you to see uh, through M and A. So watch for announcements and other things like that. And again, uh, Jason, Chris, thank you. And I'll turn it over to Lauren if she's got any more questions to or any more words, last words to say. Yes, yeah, sorry, my mouse was having a bit of a delay there. I was trying to unmute myself. Um, I will just yeah, echo uh, what Julie said, Jason, Chris, thank you so much um, for joining us tonight, for sharing all of your work with all of our viewers. Um, it looks like it was a, a smash hit there in the comments. Um, nothing but kind words and, and, and great reactions to all of your work. So thank you again. Um, 
thank you everyone who attended tonight. Uh, I know it's, we're running a little bit later tonight than we normally do, but that's that's all right. That's what happens when we're, we're enjoying what we're seeing. So um, we will have the recording up um, next week sometime for you to be able to watch again or share with uh, friends and family. Um, and we will have more of these Michigan Nature at Home uh, presentations next year. So please uh, be sure to keep an eye on michiganature.org. Uh, sign up to receive our e-newsletter and you'll get uh, updates on when those are scheduled and uh, we hope to see you at those. So thanks everyone and have a great night.